Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to this uh, important discussion. Before saying anything else, I'll ask you to turn off your cell phones if you haven't already done so. It may interfere with the sound system. My name is David Smock. I'm a vice president here at USIP in charge of the Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution. As you all know, the Supreme Court recently upheld two laws that make it illegal to provide material support to organizations designated by the State Department and Department of Treasury as being terrorist organizations and affirmed that this material support includes advice and training relating to such things as human rights, nonviolence, and peace. This workshop today has been organized to discuss three phases and implications of this decision. First is to explain exactly what the decision means and what it doesn't <clears throat> mean. Secondly, to provide some arguments on both sides of the decision. And thirdly, to provide some information on the implications of the decision for organizations like USIP and others that are involved in international peacemaking. There is biodata on the five presenters on the tables out there, so I won't go into great detail, but our lead-off speaker is David Cole, who is a professor at, of law at Georgetown University. David argued the case before the court on behalf of the Humanitarian Law Project and has been working on this case for 12 years. David. Thanks. Do you want to come up here? So the operative word there is has been working on the case for 12 years. Just before I came over here, the last call I took was a uh, call from my uh, adversary at the Justice Department at the district court level, and we have to file on Monday uh, something with the district court saying, you know, what should we do with the case at this point? Um, and we agreed that we should dismiss the case at this point. So uh, I have been working on it for 12 years, but now my life is open and free, and I have lots of opportunities to do uh, to do other things. I um, I feel a little uh, sort of guilty coming here, being the bearer of bad news and the one who uh, brought this decision uh, uh, to you. But um, uh, but as I will say at the end, I think this is kind of. Uh, a, a long struggle. This is not, by no means the end of uh, this uh, this issue uh, as uh, uh, as we go forward. And I think probably the best way to understand it and put it in context is to um, think back to uh, the pre previous period of time in our history where there was a great national security sort of threat slash panic, depending on what uh, view you take of it. Um, uh, and there was a desire, tremendous desire, because of that national security threat to authorize the government to engage in preventive measures uh, to uh, stop the bad thing from happening. The bad thing then was communism, uh, and what we had was the McCarthy era, and what the government did in the name of, of empowering itself to prevent communism from taking over the United States by force and violence um, was uh, not merely to criminalize seeking to take over the United States by force and violence, but also any advocacy of uh, Communist Party uh, doctrine, uh, any membership or association or support of the Communist Party, um, regardless of what that support uh, or advocacy uh, consisted of. And then there was an administrative process uh, in which uh, a, a secret branch of the executive uh, came up with a secret list of proscribed communist groups, and uh, and we know uh, sort of the end uh, result. Well, we see. I think the material support laws really are a kind of 21st century resurrection of that principle. Uh, now the threat is terrorism. Uh, the concern is that we need to prevent it from happening. So it's not enough to make it a crime to engage in terrorism or even to conspire to engage in terrorism or even to aid or abet terrorism. We want to um, give the government the power to act preventively to go after people who have not actually uh, uh, engaged in any or conspired in any terrorist activities. And the way we do that is by, again, 
creating a list of proscribed organizations and making anything that one does uh, in affiliation with or in support of those groups, regardless of the purpose of the aid and regardless of the end to which the aid is in fact used, uh, make it a crime. Uh, uh, and, and just as with the McCarthy era period, this gives the government very, very broad scope, uh, but also um, creates a very, very broad chilling effect on, uh, on activities that one would think we would want to encourage. And so the case um, that um, went to the Supreme Court was on behalf of the Humanitarian Law Project, a peace group uh, that had been working prior to the uh, material support statute with the uh, Kurdistan Workers Party in Turkey and seeking to encourage them to pursue peaceful um, uh, 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 ways of furthering uh, their uh, interests rather than violent ways, teaching them how to bring human rights claims, helping them bring human rights claims in Geneva, uh, and working with them on peace uh, initiatives. Once this law was, in, was put in place and the Kurdistan Workers Party was put on the list, uh, it appeared to become a crime to engage in this activity because the, the law prohibits not only the provision of money, but the provision of any expert advice, any training, any personnel, or any service to a proscribed organization, and it doesn't require any proof that the service, training, advice, or personnel is, is intended to further any kind of illegal activity or indeed is likely to further any kind of illegal activity. And even uh, in the case of our uh, clients, uh, speech that was designed to discourage terrorism, reduce resort to violence, uh, was criminalized. In the Supreme Court, we made a very uh, – we, we, we won, uh, I should say, for the first, you know, 11 and a half years, but what, that, what does that matter at this point, uh, on the, you know, on, on, the, on the issue uh, that, that this, this kind of speech is not constitutionally – cannot be constitutionally prescribed by the statute. The uh, lower courts uh, um, uh, unanimously held that the, those parts of the statute to be un. Uh, unconstitutional. But the, the Obama administration took the case to the Supreme Court. Uh, now Justice Kagan uh, defended the law before the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court upheld the law, even as against what we presented as a very narrow challenge. We weren't challenging the whole scope of making it a crime to provide support to prescribed groups, but only arguing that it's unconstitutional as applied to pure speech advocating only lawful, nonviolent activities. Uh, and there were some very strong precedents in our uh, favor, uh, going back to the Communist Party cases, where the court held that, um, yes, you can criminalize the illegal things that the Communist Party does, but you can't make it a crime for someone to support the Communist Party in its lawful ends, because it has lawful ends as well as unlawful ends, uh, uh, because otherwise you're, you're engaging in guilt by association, you're criminalizing um, lawful speech. Uh, we lost. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, upheld the law. It said that the law was a regulation of speech, thereby rejecting the government's entire defense of the statute, which was it didn't regulate speech at all. The court said, yes, it regulates speech. Therefore, it has to satisfy the most stringent, strict, skeptical scrutiny that the court ever applies. Uh, but then it applied that scrutiny uh, in a way uh, that was the most deferential, uh, kind of a limp uh, uh, version of strict scrutiny that uh, that I think has ever uh, uh, been um, uh, been witnessed before. And the court said, well, the government really hasn't um, advanced uh, very many reasons why this law uh, is necessary, why it's necessary to criminalize advocating for peace, etc. Uh, but we can imagine some reasons why it might be bad. So even if the Humanitarian Law Project and other peace groups are seeking to, in, to um, encourage only peace and nonviolence, uh, if they teach them how to bring civil rights claims, they might use that knowledge to harass and disrupt. Now, I would think that we would rather have terrorist organizations using courts to harass and disrupt than engaging in terrorism, but, uh, but no. Uh, secondly, if we, if we work with them on negotiating for peace, they might use that as a delay tactic to rearm to engage in further terrorist activity. And third, even if neither of those things come to pass, the mere act of working with them in any respect gives them legitimacy. Uh, and then they can use that legitimacy to go out and, you know, uh, get adherence and get uh, other support and engage in uh, 
uh, in terrorist activity. And that, uh, and, and, and ordinarily under strict scrutiny, the government not only has to advance arguments, the court doesn't make them up for it, uh, but um, uh, I told David it would be hard for me not to editorialize and describe it. <laughs> but, 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 but secondly, um, the, court, the court says under strict scrutiny, you have to demonstrate, you have to not only come up with a justification, but you have to demonstrate with evidence that in fact these concerns that you've identified are real concerns. Um, so where was the evidence that helping a group uh, work for peace had ever uh, uh, led to more violence or uh, encouraging bringing human rights claims had led to more violence? Of course, so, well, actually here, because the government's justification is preventive, we can't really require it to come up with any evidence, and it did not require it to come up with any evidence. Um, so at the, in the end, the court, I think, abandoned the lesson of the Communist Party era, which is that these kinds of measures are overbroad, uh, do tremendous damage to legitimate activities, uh, and that it is incumbent upon the government under the Constitution to distinguish between uh, support that, particularly when you're talking about speech, that furthers violence and uh, support uh, uh, speech uh, that does not. Um, I, I, as I said, I don't think this is the end of the line. If, if you go back to the Communist Party era, the early Supreme Court cases uh, in that era uh, all upheld these uh, kinds of measures, and it was only after um, many years and after McCarthy was censored by the Senate uh, that the Supreme Court started to establish the principles that, um, uh, that this kind of uh, uh, overbroad legislation is unconstitutional. And so I don't think this is the end. Uh, I, I think that we'll have opportunity in the discussion to talk about um, avenues for reform, but I, uh, and I think legislative reform is one possibility. I don't think many Congress members really thought that when they passed this law, they were making it a crime for Jimmy Carter uh, to go to Lebanon and monitor uh, elections in Lebanon. Uh, but they did, because in monitoring elections in Lebanon, Jimmy Carter, who filed the amicus brief in our case, had to meet with each of the parties to the elect uh, electoral conflict, provide his expert advice on what, would, on, on what to look for in a fair election. And in doing so, he met with Hezbollah, one of the parties to the election. Uh, he provided his expert advice. He engaged in criminal conduct. I don't think Congress intended to make that uh, make that a crime, and I, uh, I think there's some possibility for some kind of legislative carve-out. The last thing I'll say is, just in terms of going forward, uh, one sort of danger spot on the horizon is that the government is making arguments now, uh, and in fact prevailed in a criminal case, on a theory that says <coughs> that you can be punished not merely for working with a designated group, not merely for working with one of the groups that's on the, you know, the Treasury list or the State Department list, but for working with a non-designated group, a non-designated group or supporting a non-designated group, if the government then later shows un that unbeknownst to you, unbeknownst to you, the, the non-designated group was in fact connected to or supporting or allied with a designated group. Now, that is a very, very scary uh, uh, proposition. It's one that um, the, a, a, a court uh, upheld in a case against the Holy Land Foundation, which is currently on appeal. It's one that the government is making, uh, advancing in a, a, um, a designation case here involving a Muslim charity called Kind Hearts. So um, I will close with that, um, but happy to talk about reform efforts uh, in the question and answer. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Alastair Miller, who is director of the Center on Global Counterterrorism and Cooperation. He also teaches at both uh, Johns Hopkins and Georgetown University. Alastair. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to USIP. I, I'm going to start perhaps by disappointing many of you here by telling you that I'm not a lawyer. Uh, that might come to relief, uh, as a relief to some others, and also might bring some disappointment by saying that I see some merits in both sides of the argument. So those of you who are expecting to see a knockdown, drag-out fight between me and Ken uh, may not see that on this uh, lovely afternoon. But I want to explain by making uh, three core points why I see some merits to both uh, arguments, and then just end by uh, 
offering some final thoughts on, on how we might go, go forward with this, because I hope uh, in the same vein that David does that this isn't the end of this decision. So to explain uh, why that there's merits to both sides, first I'll talk about the sort of uh, administrative side of this, and that is the intended consequences of not only the Holder decision, but the uh, larger process of listing terrorist organizations in the first place, and how does that really help to stop terrorists. Then I want to look at the real world, and that is what do we know about how to end terrorism? How does this listing process and the Holder decision really affect counterterrorism in practice? And then thirdly, to look at the unintended consequences. How does the Holder decision undermine actions that can help to end terrorism? So to start with, on the, uh, the administrative side, um, the designation uh, of, of foreign organizations has a purpose, and I think it has a very important purpose. Um, foreign terrorist organizations are foreign organizations that are designated by the Secretary of State in accordance with uh, a section of the Immigration uh, Nationality Act um, to basically look at people in three categories. And it says that in, it's, it's, it's really rather obvious, but are they foreign? Do they engage in terrorist activity? And do they actively threaten the security of the United States or its citizens? And some of the intended benefits of that list is that it enables the Department of Justice to prosecute anyone found to be providing material support to a foreign terrorist organization. And the list provides the Department of Treasury uh, a basis from which to go and freeze the assets of those organizations uh, that are held in the U.S. if they can find those assets. The list, as the State Department states, uh, mentions, is that it also intends to stigmatize and isolate designated organizations. That all makes sense. And deter don donations and contributions to those organizations that might help them thrive and engage in activity that harms us. And it is intended to heighten public awareness of those groups that threaten us. So that all seems to make sense why we have the, the, uh, the terrorist, uh, uh, foreign terrorist organization designation list. And in a nutshell, one could argue that this puts these uh, nasty people uh, on notice and that it provides the government uh, a basis from which to take actions that undermine their activity. And on that basis, you can see why the interaction with designated groups, including the dispensation of expert advice or teaching or what have you, could be considered or should be considered under the law uh, unlawful and carry harsh penalties. Now I want to look at the second point, at the real world. And the real world is, what do we know about terrorism and how it ends? There is a lot of literature on this subject and it's based on some solid research looking at cases such as the IRA and others and how they've gone from an actively terrorist group down to something, the real, real IRA, which is far more marginalized and is not threatening the population in the United Kingdom in Ireland, and in Ireland, Northern Ireland in particular, in the same way that it did uh, throughout the 1900s and particularly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And seeing as we're at a USIP event, I thought that I would quote from two renowned experts who've contributed to a useful USI, uh, USIP report on how we end terrorism. The first one is, is Marcia, uh, Martha Crenshaw, who concludes that governments must confront, confront terrorists on two fronts. The first is uh, those among the rank and file who are disposed to violence. And the second is the population, the wider population, um, in an effort to separate or mar marginalize the former from the latter. Following from that, Paul Wilkinson also says in the USIP report that a political agreement can attract the support of a large segment of the population, and that support can be very, a very important component in the end of the cycle of violence. So in practice, if you look at the current uh, sort of doctrinal uh, underpinning of, of U.S. policy uh, in the name of counterinsurgency uh, counter strategy, you see the same logic being applied. And that is that you try to peel the popula population away from those hardcore terrorists in order to isolate them and therefore weaker the latter and follow and allow the former to address their grievances through political means. And I don't think it's an accident that we've seen uh, the Taliban removed from the FTO list because the Obama administration is trying to seek 
some accord in Afghanistan in order to peel uh, one group away from a hardcore terrorist group. We're seeing this in practice uh, by the U.S. government as we speak. So on to the third point, the unintended consequences. Whether they're academic like Crenshaw or uh, Wilkinson, as I just mentioned, or those who are on the battlefield with hardened experience like David Kilcullen or David Petraeus, uh, they have based their analysis on, on careful uh, research and case studies, and they know that segments of the population need to be peeled away from the hardcore. And in order to do that, you need to have some interaction with those groups. And the government cannot do that on its own. And there are non-government organizations that can play a very, very vital role in reaching out to segments of the population that can be peeled away. So we have a situation where we peel the general population who may have supported the IRA for whatever reason away from the real IRA and re reduce them to a, a small shadow of themselves and make them politically <coughs> impotent because we know the strongest currency that terrorists have is, in fact, the support of the population. If we can reduce that, we can help to reduce terrorism and some kind of inter interaction through proxy, through uh, groups uh, such as the one that David has been defending, helps us in that process. And the Humanitarian Law Project, for example, can help to isolate groups by providing them with advice that could bring them into the mainstream political process, as David mentioned. Yet the Holder case has led to a situation where American law schools, for example, have stopped giving advice, deliberately stopped giving, giving advice and law trainings to others outside the United States, and importantly, funding sources from the US, which has the sort of wealthiest philanthropic base in the world, with wealthy foundations and others, uh, are, are refusing uh, to give uh, money to humanitarian and human rights groups who are working on the front lines to help peel away the core from the periphery and hopefully get us into a situation where we help to end terrorism in the areas where we're fighting it. So what is the way forward, finally? I think the United States does need to have a legal and administrative basis from which to take action against terrorists who threaten the United States and its citizens. And the FTO, the Foreign Terrorist Organization designation list, does that. But the reality is that it also undermines activities that can help to isolate the violent elements of terrorism and marginalize the public and financial support that remain viable. So we have to remember terrorism isn't an exact science. And having a list and all these administrative mm -hmm. procedures isn't really all that ap applicable in the real world, and we have to be flexible. Terrorism is a social phenomenon, and countering it is therefore not an exact science and cannot be governed by narrow rules that are inflexible. The reality is that there needs to be restrictions on interaction uh, with designated groups, including the provision of material support, but there needs to be more flexibility in how those are applied. If counter countering terrorism is the objective, more careful consideration needs to be given to how legal decisions not only further that objective, but how those decisions can actually undermine that objective. I think the decision, uh, the Holder decision by the Supreme Court uh, has failed to do that and could jeopardize rather than strengthen our security. So I'll end by saying that the flexibility needs to be applied to cases where careful consideration is given as to the purpose and the end towards that support that's being given, as David has mentioned. And as David mentioned also, I really hope that this isn't the end, because if we're serious about countering terrorism, and the more that we understand the environment in which we're working on the ground, we have to give more flexibility to those groups who can operate by proxy to help to undermine terrorists as we know it. Thank you. Ken Weinstein is a partner at O'Melveny and Myers. Previously, he was Assistant Attorney General for National Security. He was Chief of Staff to the Director of the FBI and U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia and has given a lot of thought to this case. Ken? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, when Alistair started out, he... Um, stood up and said he was going to disappoint you because he's not a lawyer. Um, and I think I'm going to disappoint you because I am a lawyer. 
which I thought is usually a more disappointing factor than otherwise. Um, but uh, And like a good lawyer, I think I'm going to start out by, by raising an objection to these proceedings, and that is that I'm the guy up here who's sort of positioned somewhat contrary to the interests of the U.S. Institute of Peace. And I find that to be really unfair branding because, you know, if it was the U.S. Institute for Warmongering and Xenophobia, I'd feel a little bit better, but it's the, the Institute of Peace, so that's a cross I'm going to have to bear here. Um, but what I, what I want to do is try not to be too lawyerly here. Um, first, let's, though, let's, let's just sort of isolate what the, the issue is here and what it is that the government decided to do in passing this law. The, the government said, um, look, if you contribute funds, uh, resources, training, advice, et cetera, to an organization that is involved in terrorism, is listed as a foreign terrorist organization, whether you intend those resources specifically to go to a terrorist activity or not, you're going to um, possibly face a criminal sanction. And they made that decision uh, with legislative history, with a full uh, sort of um, – uh, analysis of the issue and with a full recognition of the pros and cons of doing that, and then over time have refined that statute um, to address some of the issues uh, that have been raised in its application. Um, but it was a very clear policy decision as reflected in that legislation. And I think that the, the analysis for today is sort of a two-step analysis. One is, it, can the government do that? In other words, is that constitutional? Um, but then the second question, which I think most of our speakers are going to and will go to, is you know, whether it's wise for the government to do that as a policy decision. Um, let me start very briefly with the, the legal analysis, and that's a pretty easy one. It's, it's easy not because I'm a brilliant lawyer, but because the Supreme Court of the United States has just said it's constitutional. Um, and some of the themes that they, they struck are, um, first, they point out that this is a matter of national security, and national security is one of the core functions if not the most core function of the executive branch. And therefore, the executive's decision in this area and the legislative branches, the political branches' decision in general, is due a uh, significant amount of deference from the courts. Um, secondly, they point out that the executive branch and legislative branch, they have the expertise in this area. They actually understand the real-life implications of this kind of support mm -hmm on the t terrorist organizations around the world and the threat that they pose to the United States. And as Justice Roberts said in, this, in the uh, opinion, it's the executive branch that gets the, the morning threat briefings every morning, not the courts. So that, that was, I think, a very important recognition of the courts, of the limits of their understanding as to the implications of this law in the real world. Um, and then uh, they point out that the political branches have made the determination that I just went through, which is, hey, if you – give to a ter foreign terrorist organization and you know that it's designated as a foreign terrorist organization or that it is involved in terrorist activities, you're going to uh, possibly face criminal, criminal sanctions. They made that determination and even uh, though that's going to have implications for people who want to give resources to organizations for, leg or for charitable reasons, they made the determination, the value judgment that that's appropriate and the court said that is reasonable given the uh, the, the government's interest in stopping terrorism. So that's, that was the, you know, there, there were many facets to the legal argument, but those are some of the main points of the legal, legal argument. Now let's go over to where I think the, the, the future of this debate really is going to be, is whether this value judgment, the policy decision that we have that's reflected by the law, is appropriate. And I will look at that as a prosecutor. I spent most of my career as a federal prosecutor and sort of look at it, look at this issue um, as uh, along the lines of, does it get the job done, and the job being protecting the United States against terrorists? Um, but also, I want to look at it in the context of our times. And this is not to say we have to look at things differently like they did in the, the era of McCarthy out of fear, but let's look at it, uh, look at this issue in the context of the threat that we're facing. And, and really, this goes back to 9-11, which coincidentally is going to be, uh, we're going to mark its anniversary tomorrow. 9-11 um, showed us two things. It showed us, one, the scale of the damage and the suffering that can be inflicted by international terrorists. We all knew that intellectually, but I think it was 9-11 that really drove home the reality that that is something that can happen and something much worse, exponentially worse, can happen if terrorists actually have weapons of mass destruction. But also, and I think more uh, directly relevant to this issue, it made us realize the inadequacy of our sort of more traditional prosecutive tools whereby... Somebody commits a crime, we 
prosecute him, we penalize him severely, and that punishment not only incapacitates that bad guy and keeps him from doing it again, but deters others from doing similar acts in the future. That works for uh, you know, a large swath of criminal conduct. It doesn't work when you have people like you had on 9-11 who are fanatics, who are not only willing to give up their lives, build into the operational plan that they will give up their lives, are looking to do that. So they're not going to be deterred by the fact that some terrorist in the past was put away for a long period of time. What that's told us is that we need to focus on preventing these terrorist attacks in the first place, not waiting till they happen and then punishing people and then thereby deterring others in the future. And so prevention really became the watchword uh, after 9-11, operationally throughout the government. And you saw that in many different ways. Um, you got the Patriot Act, which provided stronger investigative tools to the FBI and others to, to find out what terrorists are doing before they actually launch their plans. You've got the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was revised and strongly uh, enhanced in order to give uh, federal uh, authorities the ability to find out through eavesdropping what kind of plans are being hatched once again before they result in attacks. But you also had a different approach by the federal prosecutors. And federal prosecutors step back and said, okay, well, we, we can't just wait until the attack happens and then build a big case and prosecute these guys. What we have to do is we have to use the laws we have now creatively to try to interdict them. And one thing they did is we, we – what we did was we started – using sort of lesser crimes, visa frauds, false statements counts, this kind of thing, to bring people in, to, to arrest people who we thought were involved in terrorist plots. So get them off the street and incapacitate them, disrupt the plot. But we also started making much greater use of those statutes which are designed not only to prosecute people for the completed terrorist attacks, but to go, that go after people who enhance or help build the infrastructure that allows for terrorism and primarily those are the material support laws that we're talking about today. Um, and there are a number of different provisions that, are, that make up the material support statutes, but the main one that I'm talking about here is 18 U.S.C. 2339B, which is the one that says if it's a foreign terrorist designated, it's a designated as a foreign terrorist organization, you give uh, resources, training, et cetera, to that organization knowing that it's designated or knowing that it's involved in terrorism, you can face a penalty of up to 15 years. And that provision has been absolutely critical. That has really been the most used provision in our, our uh, effort against terrorism since 9-11. I think the last I saw, there are somewhere above 150 different cases that have been brought since 9-11 under that statute. And it's been used for, it's most often used for, you know, the traditional support that you would think of, money going to al-Qaeda uh, or arms being shipped to the, the Tamil Tigers, let's say. Um, but it's also used for the sort of not-so-traditional type of uh, support, uh, services, training, personnel, the kind of things we're talking about here. Um, we've had uh, – obviously, we've had a number of cases against people who have gone to terrorist camps for training. We've had people who – we've had cases against a person who helped terrorist uh, cell members get immigration papers, uh, against somebody who provided jihad training um, to young recruits. Uh, we had a case against uh, somebody who provided satellite transmission services to Hezbollah, to a Hezbollah TV station. So we've used these, this statute uh, against people who provided support other than just money, which is what most people think about. And these, this statute and its use has been absolutely vital, and it's vital for three reasons, um, or it has three uh, consequences for terrorist organizations. First, it degrades their capability. The more you, you sap their resources, the more you sap the support they have, obviously, the less capable they are of carrying out their, their, uh, their mission. Secondly, it disrupts them. Every time you, uh, you take some operative off, that disrupts the, the operation, maybe slows down uh, their, uh, whatever operation they're planning. So if uh, al-Qaeda, which is very methodical and thinks and plans years ahead, plans on having certain travel papers generated for their cell members and that the person responsible for, the, for producing those travel papers is arrested, that throws off their operational plan and helps to disrupt and prevent attacks. But also, and this is one thing I think people don't recognize, is that every time you take off somebody who's providing that kind of support, it helps to expose the uh, uh, people in the al-Qaeda network or the terrorist network because they then have to go out and find somebody else to perform that service. And whenever they have to operate or step out of their kind of uh, preset operational plan and look for somebody else to provide a service, that exposes them. That puts them out there and helps us, it help, helps make it easier for us to detect them. So it's vital that we use those uh, material, the material support laws 
against traditional terrorist organizations, but it's also vital that we use them against the organizations that we're talking about here, which are dual organizations, which have both a terrorist end as well as a non-terrorist, uh, perfectly legitimate and often very salutary uh, mission as well. And the reasons, <coughs> these all, all these reasons are laid out in the Supreme Court decision, but the reasons why it's important to use this law against organizations like that um, uh, are the following. First, while it sounds well and good to think, well, we're just giving the money for this organization to try to learn how to, to uh, build peace, there's nothing that says that money is going to stay directed toward that end and not be, re uh, be diverted over to the organization's terrorist end. So if you give money to Hezbollah, <coughs> thinking it's going to go to a hospital, there's nothing that says that the Hezbollah won't take that money and send it over for the, to uh, their terrorist <laughs> operatives. Um, similarly, there's no organizational firewall, and that's the term the Supreme Court used. Oftentimes, the inf same infrastructure that such an organization, that, uh, what I call a dual organization, same infrastructure that goes to its more salutary, uh, salutary uh, mission is also the one that's used for terrorism. Uh, so let's just take the media, uh, a media operation. You could give money to the a media operation thinking that they're going to be promoting peace in a particular region, but they could take that money and they could divert it to, the, to uh, producing um, producing video uh, that proclaims the, the glory of terrorism. Um, and the third thing I think that there's a very strong point that the Supreme Court points out is one of the reasons why you don't want to allow resources to go to these organizations, even if that, even let's just say those resources are going to go just to the charitable pursuits, is that that makes it, that allows that organization to generate goodwill, to generate adherence and recruits within the population they're targeting. It makes it harder for us to delegitimize that organization. And one of the best ways of defeating a terrorist organization is delegitimizing it in the eyes of the people uh, in its region and in the eyes of the world. And if you give them money for, uh, to build a hospital, they build a hospital in their name, people in that community are going to respect and appreciate them for doing that. It's going to make it easier um, for them to, to, to draw recruits from that community. We can, yes, we can go and we can basically just kill our way, uh, try to kill our uh, terrorist uh, organization into extinction. But I think a better way to do it is by focusing on delegitimizing them, and this statute allows them to do that. So in short, the government's argument is we need to be able to starve these organizations of resources. It, it results in some un, uh, the, the unintended effects or results in some unfortunate situations where uh, money can't go to legitimate causes, but that's something we've dealt with forever. We've had embargoes for the, throughout the life of our country, and oftentimes embargoes are directed at a country because we want to change that country's government, but it has uh, a terrible impact on the people of that country. Um, the value judgment is made that that's something that's necessary for purposes of, of our foreign policy, and this is exactly what's happening here in this area, in the terrorism area. So. For all those reasons, as a prosecutor, um, looking at this as so this issue as how are we going get to get the job done, I understand the government's decision here to go forward uh, both with this legislation and with uh, carrying out this legislation aggressively. I recognize, however, that there is a very difficult value judgment here and that there are times where people like the plaintiffs in this case <clears throat> uh, are prevented by the statute from doing things that could, could well be good. I think it's useful for groups like this to keep examining it, look at possible legislative fixes because um, our, our approach to, to counterterrorism has to change with the circumstances and we have to learn lessons as we go. So I think today is a good example of undergoing that process. And I appreciate you having me here. Thank you, Ken. Our next speaker is Chet Crocker, who is a professor at Georgetown University member of the USIP board and for a long time a chairman of our board, former assistant secretary of state for African affairs and author of many books on international peacemaking. Chet. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> very pleased to be here with this uh, distinguished panel. I also am not burdened with legal knowledge and so <clears throat> I have that uh, professional deformation of having been both a, an academic and um, a diplomat. The, the words banning, proscribing, listing, and blackballing do not exist in the diplomat's dictionary. 
And um, I have a copy of the Diplomat's Dictionary. It's sitting right in front of Kay there, written by <clears throat> my former deputy, Chaz Freeman. Um, and I checked very carefully before making that statement that those <laughs> – <laughs> because uh, he, he's spent a lot of time thinking about this, that uh, those words do not appear in a diplomat's dictionary. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Um, I spent close to a decade of my, my life uh, negotiating with and making peace with uh, parties which are, were at the time certifiable, um, indictable by today's norms, probably could be even proscribable, what we were doing, we described at the time, as trying to convince unconsenting adults to commit unnatural acts. That's mediation. That's what mediation is. So <clears throat> to the extent that this statute and its most recent interpretation create a pall or discourage mediation activities, and that's a point I want to throw at the attorneys here who are qualified to answer it, it is, uh, it is bad news for America. It's bad news for world peace, and it's bad news for the peacemaking craft. Um, what we're going to wind up doing, and I'll come back to this, is eliminating ourselves as a role player in, in some of these arenas uh, and, and leaving the agenda to others who are not um, subscribers to the lists uh, that we're talking about. So. I do think it's important to look at the five things that are supposed to be prevented, training, finance, service, advice, expertise, and where do those lines cross over to what I would call mediation or, or dialogue promotion, which is quite distinct from advice. I, I spent, as I said, close to a decade, I was always advising people, but I was advising them in my own country's national interest, not in their country's or their movement's national interest. So I think that distinction is an important one. We might want to have some conversation about whether mediation could be criminalized as distinguished from advice, as distinguished from training. Now, training is, is very important stuff, and this organization here USIP is uh, very proud of its role in training and education and is determined to expand it and continue it. So we are very much watching this debate unfold, and we're very concerned about where it might go. So that's the first point. Um, <clears throat> my former boss, uh, George Schultz, uh, when he was criticized, uh, as I was, for talking to organizations and groups and countries like Cuba or the African National Congress or the PLO back then I'd like to remark that it's not who you talk to, it's what you say to them, which sounds kind of commonsensical in a way, doesn't it? I mean, But it also depends on who are the movements or the bodies, the groups or the countries that we're talking to. And here again, I <clears throat> make a point in the interest of time very briefly. I think there's 46 organizations on this list at last count. Is that about right? 47. 47. I'm sure the number is not declining. My point is this. Most of them do not consider that they are at war with the United States. <coughs> Most of them aren't. Most of them are at war with their own governments or with another movement in their own country. So the, the question really is, is how wide is the net? And if we're talking about remedies, what should be done in that regard to have a more refined list. I have no problem with what this legislation and decision uh, portends as far as al-Qaeda is concerned. I have no brief for al-Qaeda. It's been a while since I recall that the LTTE, which no longer really exists as a military movement, was uh, aimed at the United States <coughs> or the PKK or a number of other organizations that are on this list. They do have local enemies. Lots of local enemies, but I'm not sure that we are their adversaries. So the question is how many – there's lots of armed actors, many of which are prescribed these days by either the U.S. or the EU. But my point is that not all armed actors are the same. Some are legitimate representatives of something in their own societies. Some are what I'd call venture capitalists. They are people who have seen other people do it, and they wind up getting visas, and they get – travel allowances to go to nice countries where they have decent hotels and they get lots of free meals and, and so forth. And so they become copycat 
terrorists, if you like. Uh, you look at Darfur. Darfur is a classic example of that. It started out with a couple of movements. It was now, last count, 18 movements. It's um, <clears throat> their venture capitalists or their startups. So uh, <clears throat> there's lots of lots of reasons that we might say that some groups belong on a list and some groups don't. Um, <clears throat> I would wonder <clears throat> what we would say today about talking to the to the PA, talking to Fatah. Well, we decided that Fatah is okay. <coughs> talking to Hamas is not okay. Now, that's an interesting case, and it's one we probably should discuss at the Q and A time. In the interest of time, I won't go into it. But there are <clears throat> there are some reasons we don't talk to Fatah. They have to do with our relationship. We don't talk to, to Hamas. It has to do with our relationship with Fatah and our relationship with Egypt and our relationship with Israel. So I think we have to figure out how many agendas we're getting into in this whole arena of prescribed lists. I want to come back to the point that I made about uh, the issue of mediation, and I hope that some of our panelists will shed some light on that. Um, and I think it would be useful for someone on this panel, and I'm, I guess I'm the designated hitter here, to refer to this really splendid report that's on the table outside about mediating with uh, prescribed actors. It lays out in considerable detail the kinds of criteria and considerations that should be in our mind when we decide whether or not to talk to someone. It's really quite a thoughtful summary of the pros and cons, and there are cons and there are pros whenever you make a decision to talk to someone. I, I think it was uh, Ken who said a minute ago that uh, you can sometimes offer legitimacy to someone by talking to them, and that's a factor. You have to think that through. You have to think it through. But it's also a factor that, you know, sometimes the people that you're offering uh, a chance to speak with are the people that actually control the guns in a given conflict situation. So I guess uh, I think we have to look very carefully at the pros and cons. Um, are the parties we're thinking of interested in peace? Do we have any way of judging if they're serious or not? That's a criterion that we can look at. Uh, are the parties legitimate representatives <coughs> in some way, as we view it, of, of, of uh, their movement or of their population? Do they have the capacity to deliver on a peace agreement? These are not insignificant considerations. Do they, does talking to them have some possibility of leading to behavioral change within the movement, which is a very key point that I think Alistair made. I mean, there are some movements you can influence by talking to, some movements perhaps you can't. And that's an analysis. It's not something to be defined by legislation and Supreme Court justices. I think we probably all agree about that. You need an, an actual analysis. Um, sometimes we have to figure out whether or not uh, strategic engagement in the U.S. national interest warrants talking to people even though there are risks. And if it doesn't, perhaps there are other ways indirectly that one can arrange to engage uh, with, uh, with, with such a party, using cutouts, using NGOs, using friends and allies and so forth. But there are risks, and this report that's on the desk out there is very clear on what some of the risks are. So it's a calculation that needs to be made. It needs to be made by people who are qualified, uh, qualified to make it. What can we do about this situation that we're now in as a result of this judgment? One thing we can do is to have a careful look at the 47 organizations on the list and see if they're all adversaries of the United States of America that warrant being treated in the same categories for the same reasons when it comes to funding, to training, to service, to personnel, and, and to uh, expertise, and to mediation. <coughs> I don't want to see a mediation between the United States and Al-Qaeda. <laughs> That's not my point. My point is that there might be some utility in having from time to time the capacity for our leadership uh, in mediation with some other, in some other uh, uh, civil conflicts around the world. So we can look at the lists. That's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is get uh, more skillful uh, at uh, discussions with the Department of State about the uh, capacity to obtain, to obtain waivers and talking to Treasury about uh, licenses and so forth. Um, perhaps some, some dialogue between organizations like USIP and some of those executive agencies uh, might, be, might be useful. Um, I, I personally would not think that going the legal route or going the route of more lawsuits is going to be the best option in the near term, and I would despair of going to the Congress 
for obvious reasons. I mean, the reason uh, some organizations get prescribed is because there are lobbies in this country that pay big money to get legislation passed so that somebody gets prescribed. Let's be frank and honest about it. I mean, that's the way the world works. If you don't like somebody, you go to the Hill and you get a ban implemented through legislation. So now if none of those remedies appeal to you, the fourth remedy is to let the Qataris and the Norwegians and the Turks and the Swiss and the organization of the Islamic Conference do all the mediating and do all the training. I don't think that's really what the Congress originally intended or what the Supremes had in mind either. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Chet. Our final speaker is Kay Ganain, who is the program manager at the Charity and Security Network, which is very actively engaged on the Supreme Court decision and its implications. Okay. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to describe a little bit more about what the Charity and Security Network is. Uh, it formed at the end of 2008 uh, as the result of joint effort of peacebuilding groups, grant makers, international NGOs, aid and development groups, civil liberties, uh, faith-based organizations that have problems with the collateral damage uh, that national security laws are causing to legitimate charitable development, uh, peaceful operations, and wanted to work together to formulate reform proposals and advocate for them. So um, I coordinate their efforts. They are uh, a terrific, wonderful group to work with. And we have uh, now, after nearly two years of operation, put together what we think are uh, sensible, practical reform proposals that are based on real-life field experience of, of what uh, the civil society organizations go through. Uh, so that's, that's the work that we're doing and, and will be doing, and that's what informs uh, my remarks on uh, the implications of the HLP decision uh, on international peace building. At, at the first look, uh, there's no change. The law was upheld. Uh, uh, peace building mediation has uh, been prescribed as ex prohibited expert advice and assistance uh, since the material support laws passed the Congress. So th that didn't change. But uh, what did change and is, is a big change is hope that uh, the problems the overbreadth of this law was causing for resolving violent conflict and providing uh, humanitarian assistance, hope that the courts could solve this problem or take care of it. Um, now with the Supreme Court ruling, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's done. Uh, and what uh, we now have to look at is uh, what the Congress and the administration will do. The court did not rule that we must, under the Constitution, that we must criminalize these activities. What they ruled was that uh, they would defer to Congress and the administration because of their expertise in the area of national security. That pushes the ball into the court of the Congress and the administration and imposes on them a very heavy and grave responsibility to get it right, to make sure that the facts and assumptions that they're using as a basis of these laws are in fact correct, uh, that they reflect realities on the ground, that they're smart, productive, and consistent with our values as Americans. So that is the job going forward. Um, the impacts on peace building, uh, now uh, U.S. nationals that work for international uh, peace organizations are covered by this law, whether they're based in the U.S. or not. Uh, and that's limiting their activities. Uh, U.S. organizations that are involved in efforts, for example, in Afghanistan and peace building, um, have to withdraw from certain projects or from certain meetings where their international colleagues are able to go forward with the peace efforts. Um, so this reduces both American effectiveness and influence and doesn't really do much for our reputation internationally. Um, and, uh, in addition, uh, it's making potential criminal liability for those who might be engaged in back-channel communications to arrange peace negotiations. Uh, just the logistics of working with people to get those meetings together and to make them happen uh, involves too many concrete and coordinated communications uh, for them not to be prescribed under the Supreme Court's ruling. Um, 
There's also the problem of uh, grant makers who wish to support uh, peace building activities and negotiations uh, are not sure what to do. And we've also heard uh, from lawyers who aren't sure even who they can represent, whether they're on the group or not, because they might be involved in a peace building effort with a prescribed group. I don't see any big loopholes in the HLP decision, although other legal experts may weigh in on that. Um, Chief Justice Roberts talks about uh, the ruling only applying to coordinated communications with prescribed groups. But uh, even if coordination could be clearly defined in, in these contexts, and um, for those who want to try to tackle that job, I'd have you look at campaign finance reform laws and the ongoing uh, excruciating efforts the Federal Election Commission has made to try and define that that one word. Um, it, it drills down to the most basic elements of what is necessary for peace building uh, and other nonviolent, nonviolent activities. You can't change people's direction. You can't change hearts and minds if you don't talk to them. And if you pretend they're not there, you're not going to change them either. So for activities uh, as simple as negotiation uh, for release of hostages or child soldiers or entering territories to re remove landmines uh, could also be impacted under the ruling. Uh, so the distinction between peace building and humanitarian aid is also not always entirely clear cut, uh, there is a lot of overlap. And often aid workers on the ground, because they're in the community uh, and know people, are sometimes the first ones to hear uh, that a prescribed group may be interested in peace negotiations. And they need to be able to follow through on that to try and make it happen. The impact of the ruling will be, for now, a chill on peace building and uh, humanitarian activities which um, goes against what we all want, which is less conflict and more peace in the world. So the, the question is, I think, going forward, now that the ball is back in the court of the Congress and the administration, how do we best get there? What is the smart policy? Um, in May of 2009, uh, after a three-year investigation and worldwide hearings, the prestigious International Commission of Jurists released a report assessing the damage urging action, which found uh, that governments, not just the U.S., but including the U.S., have, quote, confronted the threat of terrorism with ill-conceived measures that have undermined cherished values and resulted in serious human rights violations, close quote. It, cause, it calls on governments to reassess uh, these short-term emergency strategies before they come permanent. And I think the HLP decision gives Congress and the administration a, a good opening for such a reassessment. There are some fundamental questions they need to ask. Uh, Mr. Weinstein referred to the congressional consideration in passing the material support laws that looked at, uh, investigated the factual background We've, we've been trying to find uh, specific facts, examples, or information in the public record to support the congressional findings uh, around this, and so far we've been able to do it. Uh, there's a, the uh, law itself has a finding that uh, foreign organizations that engage in terrorist activity are so tainted by the criminal conduct that any contribution to such an organization facilitates that conduct. And then uh, a House report from 1995 uh, basically makes the fungibility argument that any aid to a prescribed organization frees up dollar for dollar um, money that can be used for violent ends. If, if that's the case, there are maybe ways we can find to prevent that. It's not necessarily inevitable. But the real question is, um, is that still the case? What is the actual factual situation on the ground? Under what circumstances does uh, the situations that Mr. Weinstein referred to actually occur? How can it be prevented? How can we fulfill our humanitarian obligations under international law and as with our values as Americans and and still uh, prevent supporting violent activity? That's uh, uh, fact-finding investigation. I think Congress and the administration are obligated to undertake now given the extreme level of deference uh, to, their, to their judgment. And we should not be relying on flawed assumptions or what may very well turn out to be flawed assumptions that have dominated policy in this area for some time. Uh, for example, 
the fungibility argument. Uh, where are, are the factual situations to support that? I don't think it happens in every case. It may happen sometimes. When is that? How can it be prevented? The other is that this radioactive theory that basically if you put a group on the list, they're delegitimized and over time will lose their public support. If that were the case, then why is the Kurdistan Workers Party, which was on the list, um, still active? The day after the Supreme Court decision this year, uh, an affiliated organization with the PKK was responsible for a bus bombing in Istanbul that killed 11 people, including four civilians. So obviously since uh, all the time that David has worked on the HLP case, if they had been allowed to go in and do their human rights training, and mediation work with the PKK back when maybe incidents like this might have been avoided, but at least it's clear that in all that time they haven't been so delegitimized that they've ceased operations. There's also this false choice between uh, safety and uh, aid and humanitarian activities. I think we need to look at this as an opportunity to have a discussion on how to break out of that. We don't have to accept uh, what's called the collateral damage of denying humanitarian aid or criminalizing peace building in order to make effective use of the material support laws. Um, our group has proposed changing the material support law to legalize the peace building activities and to legalize humanitarian aid that's required by the Geneva Conventions when there's no reasonable alternative but to provide it through a terrorist organization and when lives are at stake, lives of civilians. Um, the other uh, way to do this would be under existing law when Congress passed a material support statute. It did include a provision empowering the Secretary of State to make exemptions for expert training, advice, and assistance uh, when she finds that uh, such activities are not a threat to national security. And peace building, I think, enhances our security, doesn't threaten it, and maybe a simple and quick way out of this problem would be for the Secretary of State to take such action. So uh, my conclusion, I think uh, I encourage you all to pursue dialogue uh, and fact-finding and to urge the Congress and the administration to do the same. Let's have a uh, policy here that's based on reality and ba also but based on our values as Americans on humanity and a belief that we can turn people away from violence. Thank you. We have about uh, 20 or 30 minutes for Q&A, and uh, <coughs> we have mics, which we will bring to you when I recognize somebody who has a question they want to make. You can we'll start in the back there. You'll identify yourself. And Hi, I'm Cindy Buell. I work for Congressman Jim McGovern in the House, and I really didn't want to be the first question, but that's the way it goes. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one, I'm trying to figure out who determines whether or not someone has possibly engaged in criminal activity. Is that like our um, Justice Department, um, you know, or you know how you how that how that happens, right? Because there is an interpretive process here. I mean, there's a like any legal case, there's a someone determines somewhere that a criminal activity might have occurred, begins an investigation, and then ultimately brings charges. And I'm trying to f figure out from this whether that's the Department of Justice that does that um, and not, you know, um, s some lawyer, Joe Schmidt, in his, you know, um, in, a, in a law firm decides that makes a determination and tries to bring you to court or something. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how that process might work. I, I guess along with that is, would the Justice Department, or as you kind of said, came in and go, maybe the State Department be, or the Treasury Department be issuing regulations or guidelines to further define some of these categories or something, would that be the next kind of step here? That And then that would be something that people could weigh in on. And my last piece of this is, let's take this as a hypothetical case. Um, you have been approached by families who have relatives who are hostages taken by a pre prescribed group. 
they have asked you to be an interlocutor with that prescribed group in trying to get their, their relatives free. You go, because you're not a naive naif on these kinds of issues, and it's not the first time you've been invited to such a barbecue, um, you go to the State Department, you let them know what you're, you've been asked to do, you seek their advice. Since they cannot directly mediate or negotiate with this prescribed group, they give you the green light, certainly not in writing or anything. They actively work to make sure that, they're, that the U.S. government puts no obstacles in your way. You go to the national government where that prescribed group in the country that operates. You let them know what you're doing, what you've been asked to do by the families. You, they're not really happy about it, but they're not putting any obstacles in your way. Can you do this, or are you now going to be, you know, possibly subject to prosecution if you act as an interlocutor on behalf of these families to try and get their relatives free? I guess that's a nice little hypothetical, which happens all the time in a wide variety of cases because I think, as Ambassador Crocker said, you don't mediate with your friends. You mediate with difficult parties, proscribed groups, or your enemies. Um, he didn't quite say it that way, but <laughs> that's my paraphrase. Um, and so those are my questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody want to take that up? Um, the, in re addressing your hypothetical, uh, I know these situations arise all the time, and unfortunately there are no clear answers that I know of. It, it depends on the, what level of risk the person involved is willing to take on personally in terms of prosecution. Uh, there also seems to be in some situations, uh, especially in disaster relief in areas controlled by uh, prescribed organizations of a don't ask, don't tell policy seems to be emerging with the State Department, which is uh, we will pretend we don't know what's going on because uh, the law has forced us into that. Just okay. if, if I could address your first question. The, I think the question was when it comes to the enforcement of the statute, who is it who decides um, we, th we think we should undertake an investigation of person A for possibly providing material support to a foreign terrorist organization, and that is the Justice Department. The Justice Department has sole discretion to decide whether to initiate a grand jury investigation, to start you know, uh, investigating, getting documents, talking to people, and finding out whether whatever conduct was undertaken violates the provisions of the statute. And Obviously, the Department of Justice also has the decision as to whether or not to actually bring a criminal case. And so keep in mind, there's also prosecutorial discretion. And prosecutorial discretion applies to when you have a situation which might technically violate the law, should we go ahead and bring that charge or not? Or should we bring a lesser charge? And that prosecutorial discretion is um, factors into any charging decision for any type of crime, but particularly in a situation like this where you have – people who might have technically violated the law, but their intent was not to provide assistance to terrorist activities per se. If I could just add to that um, uh, two things. One is um, that prosecutorial discretion is, a, uh, in theory, a, a, a response, but I don't think it's a very um, satisfactory one. Um, one, because it is discretion. You have no right to engage in the activity. You're, you're sort of hoping that a prosecutor won't uh, uh, take you on uh, with respect to it. Two is that in our case, you know, with the Humanitarian Law Project, which was seeking to do peacemaking and, and human rights advocacy, this, the government could have resolved the case from the outset by saying, we are not going to prosecute you. We, in our discretion, we will not prosecute you. That We then would not have had any standing to, to challenge the law, and the case would have gone away. But n instead, they spent 12 years arguing we have the right to go after you and to prosecute you. And the, th the, the third thing is that it's not just the Justice Department because – and it's not just the State Department's list of 47 groups because, as many people in the room probably know, there's also a Treasury Department list – 
And that has uh, several thousand um, names of groups and uh, individuals on it. And the same proscriptions essentially apply to it, except that they can be enforced civilly uh, as well as criminally, which means they can be enforced by uh, OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, the Treasury Department, um, so that uh, it's not even just the Justice Department that's making these decisions. There are a whole host of um, of uh, there are something like t- uh, 20 uh, government entities that are involved in one way or another in terror financing, uh, regulation, oversight, uh, investigation, uh, and the like. And so with respect to core criminal prosecutions, yes, Justice Department, but uh, that's you're not off the hook uh, simply because there's not a criminal prosecution. Thank you. Yes, in front here. Yes, my name is Jim Jones. Uh, I work as a consultant, and in the past I have worked in countries under conflict and have had some modest engagement with uh, organizations that are on the the list of uh, 47, I think you said. Let me first off say that I certainly agree with uh, Ambassador Crocker that any, any list of 47 that is as disparate as this one is, one has to question what, you know, what... uh, uh, what what sense does it make to even have the list? Uh, the I'd like to, to comment and, and and maybe get your comment on something that you said, uh, Ken. Um, the you talked about the importance of uh, de, uh, legitimating okay groups that are, are that are on this on this list, and the U.S. clearly uh, makes an effort to do that. It seems to me that there's a flip side to that coin that's rather, uh, that's rather dangerous. Uh, and that is in the process of delegitimating the groups. In effect, the U.S. is, is sometimes legitimating uh, organizations opposed to the foreign terrorist organization. And those organizations are guilty of enormous human rights abuses. Um, and that that is a a, a very very uh, a dangerous thing. Uh, and I, I the country one country that I have in mind specifically now is Colombia, uh, where I have uh, some experience and have engaged with uh, at least one of the insurgent groups. And efforts were made to burn me because of that. Uh, so at any rate, I this this whole notion of of delegitimating, okay, and its flip side of of legitimating. Uh, uh, I, would anybody care to comment on that? I'll start. Um, <clears throat> you're right. It's a it's it's a policy decision, a value judgment, whether to put a particular organization on the foreign terrorist organization list, and that's for the Secretary of State to make that determination. Um, and we can all question that determination as to every one of the 47 odd organizations that are on there, whether they should be or shouldn't be. And there would be some people who'd say, "There's nothing; th- these people should not be on the terrorist for terrorist organization list," and you know, for the following reasons. And others would would argue uh, contrary. And where the arguments might be that, yeah, look, this this organization, gee, maybe they're resorting to some tough measures, but look at the people they're up against; they're really bad people. Um, so yes, we could we could probably go through a number of the 47 and find that they are up against people who are no more savory than them. Um, bottom line is, and I think this comes through very clearly in the Supreme Court decision, that's a policy decision for the government to make, for the executive branch. And so I think that that leads to the point that we've heard from a number of the panelists here, which is step two of this is to try to influence that decision making as to whether the list we have right now really is the right list. And to the extent that it, the, it is the right list, should there be measures in place to sort of soften the impact of this? And so, I might just add one thing to that, and that is that there is a process at the State Department where the list is reviewed, those designations are reviewed every two years. So it's not like they've, you put, get put on the list once and you can never come off. But one thing that sort of baffles me is that there is an opportunity for redress and that you can, in fact, appeal and see if you can get your name off the list. But I'm not sure where that process now goes in relation to the, the court decision because if you want to get legal advice and support for how to, how to get your name off the list, uh, you're then in trouble. Um, and the other last point that I have on legitimacy is I also wonder in the case of some of the worst groups out there, and we all, I think, resoundingly agree that al-Qaeda should be on the list, uh, they enjoy 
that sort of legitimacy. Uh, they feel that, that being called upon and picked out by the United States is, uh, is sort of a badge of honor. And then finally, my point would be made, my last point would be that it seems that removing uh, names off the list has a political agenda uh, behind it. And taking uh, North Korea off uh, as a state or taking groups off uh, in order to try and engage with them might actually uh, seem to the rest of the world as something that's rather arbitrary and not in relation to their activity necessarily. I, 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 I want to make a short legal point about legitimacy as a justification for criminalizing speech. Um, never before has – this is, I think, a, a very, very dangerous um, sort of uh, precedent because never before has the court said that it's okay to criminalize speech. That's what this case was about. It was about whether the government can criminalize speech. The court said, yes, it's criminalizing speech. It's okay. Why? Because – if you say good things about the group or you speak to the group, it'll, then people will think good things about the group, and we have an interest in delegitimating the group. Well, that are, if you take that argument and you apply it to the Communist Party cases, they all would have come out the other way, right? The, the Supreme Court ultimately ruled you can't make it a crime to advocate communist doctrine. You can't make it a crime to be a member of the Communist Party. You can't make it a crime to associate with and support the legal ends of the Communist Party. Those are all unconstitutional because they penalize speech and association. But under this decision, Congress would simply have had to say, well, we, we wanted to delegitimize the Communist Party, which is, of course, exactly what they did want to do. Uh, and that was never accepted as a, as a justification for, for criminalizing speech. So I think that's a very, very dangerous precedent to give the government the power to say, we can make your speech a crime if we don't like what you're saying about a particular group because it, quote, unquote, legitimates that group. If, if I may just clarify one thing, it, it is dangerous to – well, let me step back and say, this, is inter this, this whole area is fraught with difficulty <clears throat> because this is the intersection of national security law enforcement and speech. Uh, terrorism is suffused with philosophy. It's not like – it's not like drug dealing, which is just all about making money. Terrorism always has some end, expressive end, and so therefore you, it, it's fraught with difficulty. That being said, um, uh, in this case, the Supreme Court made it very clear that if I got walk out in the streets right now and said, you know, go PPK, uh, I, I, I am behind everything they say, that's not against the law. I can independently advocate on behalf of the ends of all these terrorist organizations, and I have not violated the law, and the court is very clear about that. It's only if I do so in coordination with that terrorist organization, and then the, the, the Department of Justice says, wait a minute, that would be material support. And, and the court was very clear. All the court said was that the government concedes that independent advocacy is not prohibited, but we're not going to decide and we're not going to tell you what kind of coordination turns your advocacy into a crime. So when the New York Times published an op-ed by uh, the Hamas leader saying what Hamas wanted, or the Washington Post and the LA Times all did that. They coordinated with that Hamas leader to take his words, edit his words, publish his words, provide a service to him in coordination. They weren't engaged in independent advocacy. Should that be a crime? Uh, and the court didn't answer that question. And so again, you've got this tremendous chilling effect where you, you really, yes, you can speak, if you don't ever talk to the group, you can speak up on its behalf. But if you ever talk to the group, you may be engaged in a crime if you speak up on it. Yeah. Chad? Uh, a quick comment that that <clears throat> lefty pinko president Richard Nixon when he went to China I think <laughs> was, was was probably saying that uh, he, he was definitely not legitimizing the the PRC uh, it kind of depends what you say to the PRC it, it seems to me but uh, really what we're all saying in a way is that we need more visibility into the process of both listing and delisting and that could be very helpful I don't know the last time somebody was delisted maybe there's some experts in the panel who do know but if this list keeps getting longer and longer, what it means is that there are fewer and fewer people we can talk to, we Americans can talk to, or anybody who receives American funding can talk to. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was actually the Taliban uh, about uh, three months ago. It was. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've got one. No. I've got a question, more of a statement from our overflow group. We've got two rooms full of people who weren't able to fit in here. This is more of a statement than a question, but addressing the fungibility and giving monetary support to group for humanitarian purposes, 
couldn't money be used to actually build a hospital rather than giving money to a terrorist group, designated group, to build the hospital in case the money was to be diverted for another purpose. So, as I say, it's more of a statement than a question. Yes? Uh, this is a uh, take the microphone. This is Derek Brown with the Peace Appeal Foundation. Uh, we joined the uh, amicus brief that David filed uh, in the case. So the, not that David filed, but the uh, the ACLU filed. This is probably a question for Ambassador Crocker, which is um, I, I actually think it's perhaps more about the waivers or the process by which organizations at this point in time uh, get clearance to have conversations. But that said, um, it, it, that, that sort of presumes a Soviet-style mediation program where the U.S. government can anticipate whatever openings are there or can request openings. And it seems to me, and I would ask your comments on whether or not you think mediation as it has been practiced, is far more chaotic. It comes up much more randomly from the days in which Stan Scheinbaum first had contact with the PLO and that you know, led to the opening up of the Oslo process. It seems to me we, we, there's almost no way that proactively people who are engaged in mediation, whether they're U.S. citizens, uh, can get the kind of clearances that would allow them, you know, they're going to have to take the risk at the end of the day. Well, I'll jump in on this because I, I did ask the question to those who are legally trained. I, I made the point up front that I'm not burdened with legal knowledge. Is it criminalized beha criminalizable behavior to, to meet with both sides in a civil conflict, an armed conflict, if one of the sides is on the list, if they pay for their coffee and you pay for your coffee? I mean, mediation works best with Italian food, but in this case, in, in this case, you'd go Dutch. Is, is, is it illegal to meet with both sides, not to train or to advise or to provide expertise, but to start a process as a Track Two organization? I see John Marks over there with a distinguished Track Two organization. There's probably a lot of others uh, here in the room as well as this one right here. We're, we're not an NGO; we're a Quango. We're, we're, we're quasi something, <laughs> but but I think that the, the lawyers you have to answer that question because I, you, know, you know lawyers are not good at answering questions. We raise questions, but <laughs> the uh, um, but I think that the, I'll tell you what the government said. They said you can you can join a group that's on the list. You can become a member because they because the Supreme Court hasn't overturned the cases saying you have a right to be a member. Uh, you can go and talk to. <laughs> Uh, members of the PKK. But if in talking to them you give an answer that's based on any kind of specialized knowledge um, or you provide any kind of service that might be of benefit to them, then you're violating the law. So mediation could be construed as a service to both parties and therefore of benefit to both parties and therefore a crime. And if you're an expert mediator, maybe if you're a really, you know, Ignorant mediator, and you have no you have no specialized knowledge. But if you're an expert mediator, uh, then you're providing your uh, expertise. Um, so it's it's very uh, you know. I mean, I, at the oral argument, Chief Justice Roberts said to the government, I, you know, you say you can go talk to these groups, but if but if you you know give them an answer that's construed to come from ex, some kind of expertise, it's a crime. I don't see how anyone could understand this statute. That's what he said. But then he wrote a decision saying it's perfectly clear, no, no problem, uh, and it's constitutional. I'd just like to add in terms of, of the waivers, it, uh, what we are proposing that the Secretary of State do is issue a general waiver that would uh, contain clear standards that could uh, be used by groups engaged in peace building rather than having to go on a case-by-case -case basis and get uh, permission. It's uh, inefficient, and, but it also creates, uh, it taints the proceedings by putting a State Department uh, green or red light on a particular group. And I, just to follow up on that, I think that's a great idea, and there is precedent for it. There is a general waiver for certain forms of legal services um, to these designated organizations, and they've, they've got categories, so you don't have to go ask them. There's a general waiver. So a general waiver would be a way to, to get a categorical exception for some kind of peace initiatives that doesn't require congressional uh, uh, legislation, so could be done by the executive, 
which might be more amenable than Congress um, uh, and certainly more rational, uh, or hopefully more rational. So that, I think that's a great suggestion. John? Hi, I'm John Marks from Search for Common Ground. And as Chet just said, we engage in this kind of activity, but not with organizations like Al-Qaeda. And I would draw a real distinction here between, let me just say, Al-Qaeda and probably four or five others in the world, and then others on that list. There's a group on that list that the U.S. government protects in Iraq um, because they have a political reason for protecting them. Are the soldiers who protect the compound of one of those organizations in violation of this law? Um, that list is a very uneven list. There's a group that recruits from Brooklyn for members in Israel um, that's on that list. And so the thing that I object to, I think, about the most, and I'm not talking about the larger constitutional or argument that David would bring out, but is kind of the, the deprivatization of track two diplomacy. The fact that now we have to go for a license or a waiver to the U.S. government, or at least be looking at that, which over the years, a expertise has grown up, a way of dealing with problems. I mean, while Chet was doing his great mediation in Southern Africa, there was a private group called San Egidio that was doing the same thing in Mozambique with a group that absolutely would have been on that list if it had existed, Renama. I mean, these were terrorists to their core. And after five or six years, they were able to mediate a peace settlement, which eventually the governments came back in. But it probably wouldn't have been consistent. Well, it depended on which government. Um, but it probably wouldn't have been consistent with U.S. government policy at the time to do it. And, you know, it's an Italian group, but would they have been given a license or a waiver to do this? And I just think what we're doing here is using a sledgehammer to deal with a problem that, deal, that calls for a great deal of sophistication. There are groups and then there are groups. And I don't have any answer to remedies. I think the general waiver one that you brought up is an excellent, excellent idea. But it's something that could really have a profound impact on the work that many of us in this room do. And that's why we're so concerned. Can I, just to be fair here, uh, take the, uh, the State Department side of the argument in, in, in responding to your very good point, and that is nobody wants to engage with al-Qaeda. You don't want to. Uh, nobody in this room wants to, and you say that there are groups on the list that are separate from that, but it's a real challenge, actually, for those who are analyzing and, and looking at the, the list uh, every year to see whether there are links or not with al-Qaeda. And some of those links might be actual operational links. Some of them might be these, uh, I think someone mentioned the, uh, the entrepreneurial uh, copycat type who, who might say they have a link with al-Qaeda, but they don't really. So it, it is very, very difficult for the State Department as well to just say, oh, okay, these are the, really the worst people on the list, and here's some people that might be better. Uh, it's not that easy. And some of them do have these nefarious links behind the scenes that, that maybe you and I don't even know of. So I, I think we have to take that into account as well. In the back there. No, you. Yes. Hi, uh, Jim Joseph from Arnold and Porter in Washington. Uh, I'd like to disagree with one thing Professor Cole said, that uh, lawyers don't answer questions, they ask them. <laughs> I'm in the position representing groups that are part of Kay's network and others where I do have to answer these questions. Uh, can we go meet with Hamas and do X, Y, Z? Uh, and, you know, Hamas, I think, is a very good example of, of one that creates very difficult issues. The UK government doesn't consider them a terrorist organization, the political arm of Hamas. They've divided them into two. And yet the US does to bring humanitarian aid to uh, you know, parts of Palestine, to build hospitals in Palestine. Even if you tried to build it yourself, you'd have to get permits to do that. You'd have to talk to the political arm of Hamas. I mean, how do you deal with these questions? How do you answer them? You know, other than saying you have to rely on uh, you know, uh, prosecutorial discretion, which maybe you might have a sense that President Obama's administration wouldn't do this, wouldn't prosecute you, but there's a five-year statute of limitations. President Palin's administration might. You know, uh, what do we, uh, you know, how do we answer these questions, and is it just that we shrug our shoulders and say we really don't know? Any comment? 
other questions. That's what, I mean, I, I think that just underscores why discretion is not sufficient and what the Constitution, you know, what, what we ought to demand as citizens, and I think what the Constitution demands, is that there be a narrowly crafted law. And this is the opposite of a narrowly crafted law. The, 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 those questions arise because there's a failure to, to, to uh, draft it narrowly. Chad? Okay. Just a, a quick reference back to the issue of legitimacy. Most of the organizations we're talking about have guys, and it's mostly guys, who live by the gun and have no future career prospects without a gun. And most of these organizations also have people who have other kinds of skill sets, shall we say. And the best way to delegitimize the guys with the guns is to find a way to engage with the guys that don't have the guns or don't rely on those p particular skill sets. Um, but obviously, you've got to watch it case by case. Uh, my problem with this whole conversation is who's making the case by case judgments? Is it the Supremes? Is it Justice? Is it Treasury? Is it State? Is it the Congress? Um, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's very humbling to realize that there's no answer to that question right now. Yes, up in front here. My name is Mary Ann Stein, and I'm the president of Private Foundation and the founding chair of the Fund for Global Human Rights, which um, funds human rights organizations that are on the ground in the countries where the abuses are taking place. And frankly, um, we're bravely proceeding and making our grants, but I think that we and many of our grantees are terribly threatened by um, this legislation and these court decisions. And another one that I know, David, you're running an amicus to be brief about is the Holy Land case, um, where not only do we have the organizations that are on these lists, but we now have organizations that aren't on the list, where um, we can be found uh, criminally uh, implicated for making contributions if the government then announces ex post facto that these groups are associated with or controlled by uh, the prohibited groups. So I think we all have to keep in mind that's the direction this is going um, and that this is, is very problematic. And I just want to pick up on some of the human rights issues, the floods in <laughs> Pakistan. Pakistan is full of um, groups who are um, possibly linked with um, terrorist organizations, and some of them, I believe, are terrorist organizations on these lists. I'm not as familiar with the contents of the lists as everyone else. Um, and yet, we have millions of people who are suffering, and material aid um, needs to get to these people, yet some of them will come into the rubric of these decisions of material aid. This is, in my mind, incredibly immoral and counterproductive. We are in a battle for hearts and minds in Pakistan, and um, this is something very troubling. Somebody else mentioned the issue of child soldiers. A number of the organizations that the Fund for Global Human Rights supports are negotiating with um, terror groups to try to get them to stop conscripting children. Please, it needs to be continued. So I, I want to say two things. One, I think it's not just peace negotiations um, and mediation that needs um, to be looked at and in some way exempted or protected from this kind of a ban, but it is um, a lot of other kind of act kinds of activities that need um, to be looked at very carefully and um, and written out of the prohibition. And um, I think, I'm not sure exactly where that can happen, but I also would suggest that the argument that you made, Ken, and I can't read your last name, that um, isolating these groups is always a positive or by not dealing with them, we delegitimize them. I'm not sure we have the proof of that. I think we may, in fact, have the proof that sometimes that's counterproductive. And so I think um, the underlying premise here is not necessarily correct and really needs to be looked at. And if it is correct, it needs to be applied where it's really evidentially shown to be the case and in a way that is as productive as possible and 
the least counterproductive possible from a point of view of our national interest and the moral interests and humanitarian interests that are all connected here. You may want to comment. I just want to make one uh, comment, and that is, uh, you know, you struggle with this as a philanthropy. I also also wear two hats. I'm the president of a foundation as well, and it's a very, very difficult call, and you don't want to get yourself in trouble. And, in fact, if you look at the State Department itself and USAID, they've been in trouble for giving money. Uh, there was one case of a Bosnian uh, organization that received money that was, was a listed entity. So, you know, if the government can't do it, it's very hard uh, with the information that they supposedly have. It's very hard for private organizations. But on the other, other side of the coin, the point that you make about humanitarian assistance and how it's immoral uh, to, you know, prevent people in those situations from receiving aid is well taken. But is it also not immoral for the people who receive that aid to be using it for nefarious purposes? And I think this highlights a great challenge for the government as well. I mean, one has to understand that restrictions are placed not because they want to hurt people in floods, but because there is a distinct possibility, and the OFAC has long lists of, of cases where people actually do abuse money that they receive under the auspices of official aid. So it's a conundrum, and it's a very, very complicated case that, that although it tucks, tugs at our heart str uh, strings is, is more difficult than perhaps uh, one might suggest. I'm not it, suggesting it's not very difficult. I'm suggesting the lines have to be more carefully drawn than they've been drawn now. Thank you. 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 Thank you
it was not enough for the government to prove that you joined and aided the Communist Party and the Communist Party engaged in illegal activities. They had to prove that you intended to further those illegal activities. And then you are guilty. But if you intended to further its civil rights work or its um, employment, you know, organized labor organizing work or what have you, um, and did not intend to further its illegal activities, then you are not guilty. The Communist Party may be guilty, but you're not guilty. Um, I think that's the principled line, but I think that would be very, very difficult to get uh, enacted. And I think maybe some carve-out for some kinds of very, very um, sympathetic activities like peacemaking efforts and human rights uh, advocacy um, might be possible. Okay. If I could, the, um, David's point about putting an intent element in there, and that, that's actually – the first thing that everybody's thought of, and at first blush it seems to make sense. Well, you can only actually face criminal penalties by providing support to a designated FTO if you intended to actually further that FTO's terrorist uh, activities. Makes sense. The problem is it, it really isn't workable as a matter of enforcement because the reality is it would be impossible, well, not impossible, very difficult for us to prove up, the prosecutors, I should say, to prove up what your intent was. I mean, just to, to use a sort of absurd example, it could mean that al-Qaeda could open up a hospital, and I could then send a check to al-Qaeda, say, for the hospital in the little memo line, and, you know, knowing full well that it's actually not going to be used for the hospital, it's going to go for terrorists, you know, for bombs and stuff, but it would be impossible for the government to prove up that I really intended to further terrorist activities as opposed to the, the charitable activities. That's the problem, and that's why... The Congress said, look, if you, you, the intent required here is simply to intend to provide resources to an, what, what you know is a foreign terrorist organization or an organization involved in terrorism. And that's just a very real problem. We would not be able to prove those cases up, and as a result, much more, res, much more support would go to terrorist organizations. It, just to step back a second, though, everybody's correct here that the problem is one of line drawing, and it's not unique in this area, but the whole problem here is line drawing. I agree that uh, there should be a focus on a possible carve-out for some kind of peacekeeping activities. There already is a specific carve-out in the legislation for materials, religious materials, or medicine. Um, that's already in the legislation. So you're not going to be exposed to criminal liability if those are the type of materials you provide to an organization. Maybe something akin to that could be crafted for peacekeeping kind of activities. The problem is um, further line drawing, for instance, saying – well, um, you know, al-Qaeda obviously is a bad organization. Everybody agrees with that. But what about Hamas? Some people agree, some people don't. It's hard to, to draw those lines, and that's why the court said, hey, we put that in the hands of the executive branch that has the best information to make the policy decision as to which organization should be and shouldn't be on the list. If I could just say one word on this intent uh, uh, thing. There are hundreds and hundreds of statutes criminal statutes that require the government to prove intent. And it gets convictions every day. Every conspiracy uh, uh, prosecution requires uh, proof that there was intent to further the end of the conspiracy. Every aiding and abetting uh, uh, prosecution requires intent to further the crime that you're aiding and abetting. And the government gets those convictions. So the notion that it somehow be impossible to prove that because someone wrote a, you know, this is for hospitals and sent it to Osama bin Laden, uh, that they, he could, that person couldn't be convicted, I, I think is, is just begs credulity. No, I got, I've, I've got to respond to that. The, the, <laughs> the reality is, I, you're right. There's an intent element in absolutely every criminal uh, provision, and there is one in this one. And I've told you what the intent is that, re that Congress requires. But the problem is if you have, let's take a Hamas. If you have a Senate check into Hamas, and you say, I'm just doing this because I want to help Hamas out. And Hamas takes that money and puts it right into guns that it uses for terrorist activities. There's no way we'll ever be able to prosecute a person like me. And as a result, the, the, the channels will be open to, to provide support to those organizations. So it's a very real problem. Unless I'm stupid enough to walk around uh, or to put in that memo uh, – line, this is for terrorism, it really is going to be very difficult because these organizations, the dual organizations, have two prongs to them. And all I have to say as a potential defendant is, hey, I was going for the charitable prong, not the other. And uh, I can tell you it would be very difficult. It would be difficult, but, that, but that's, that's exactly the difficulty that the 
the Supreme Court said the Constitution demands with respect to the Communist Party at a time when the Communist Party was you know, the greatest threat to the United States uh, in the world, backed by the second greatest superpower with massive nuclear weapons directed at us. And nonetheless, the Supreme Court said, you've got to prove intent. I don't see why the same shouldn't be true with respect to Hamas. There, I'd like to uh, interject a, another angle at coming at this problem that could be part of a legislative fix, um, which I think there's some uh, – the Congress has a responsibility to do some oversight and some fact-finding uh, before they settle on a legislative fix, and that uh, includes getting information and taking advantage of the expertise of the NGOs that do this work on the ground. And what – what a lot of the NGOs are thinking is uh, we good faith and due diligence should be taken into account here when it should be part of this line drawing process. Maybe you can't prove, you know, the, the intangible thing inside my head uh, that is intent, but I can demonstrate I acted in good faith uh, to have the resources of my charity go for humanitarian aid or be used for peace building, and I can show that by uh, concrete steps of due diligence, uh, oversight, uh, and things that are well-known practices within the NGO sector that, that I've engaged in, and that can be demonstrated. The problem has been, uh, especially in the Treasury Department to date, a lot of the people in charge of the enforcement don't have the background in the NGO sector and the knowledge and expertise to really appreciate what those practices are and to understand uh, how good faith can be concretely demonstrated through these uh, you know, visible kind of actions. It's not an intangible thing that would have to be measured. But in terms of uh, legislative fixes, there's nothing pending in Congress right now. There is the, the first ever oversight hearing on uh, these issues broadly, including due process, clear standards, material support, was held in the House in May. Um, and uh, that's the first time since 9-11 that there's been any congressional oversight at all. And more of that needs to happen. Uh, and uh, hopefully there will be some legislative fixes uh, under consideration soon. Take one more question. Yes, Eric. Hi, um, my name is Eric Miller. At the moment, I'm a private citizen. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm also a political analyst uh, for Central Africa. But um, my question is that under the way the law seems to be construed, the only alternative is war. If you can't negotiate with anyone, how can you even begin the process for conciliation, uh, confidence-building measures? If it's simply, uh, let's say, this terrorist organization or rebel group decides one day, I would like to open up for peace negotiations or work out some sort of amnesty deal, but if you can't even send a liaison to meet with them to begin preliminary meetings, then it, the only result is perpetual war. And also, uh, Mr. Uh, Weinstein, you said that um, you, you believe it rests solely in the purview of the executive to make the decision which groups are terrorists. But um, since we're all human and the executive is comprised of humans, we make mistakes. You know, today's allies could be tomorrow's enemies. Tomorrow, yesterday's allies are tomorrow's enemies. We uh, gave weapons to the Mujahideen, and now there's Al Qaeda uh, from their offspring, and also. Uh, we supplied, uh, we, we had contracts with Victor Booth, uh, one of the world's greatest arms dealers, and this was out of the State Department and DOD. So how can we say that the executive is going to get it just right and that if those uh, same standards you apply to private citizens when the government can't even make the correct distinction? Well, as of the second half of your question, um Keep in mind, there is a process by which an organization that's on that list, that's designated, can challenge that designation. I believe one of the two organizations here did challenge their designation and, and failed in the courts. Am I right? Yeah, but the, uh, that's because the process is you get to say, I shouldn't be on the list. The government gets to say, you should be on the list. The government gets to put all its evidence in in secret, and you don't get to put any evidence in. So that's the process. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, last time David and I went around the, the bush <laughs> on this issue, and uh, but it's uh, there is a process for challenging it, um, and I, I agree that um, you know that one of the good byproducts of this debate is sort of renewed scrutiny on who is and who isn't on the list. Uh, the the problem is sort of okay, fine. If it's not the in the hands of the Secretary of State, uh, should it be in the hands of every private citizen to make that decision? I mean that 
you know, who's going to do it? And that's sort of what the court said. The court said, look, it's really not our place to, to, to uh, supplant the executive branch here. The executive branch is the, is the branch of government that has the, the best information. Maybe it's not perfect information. Maybe they don't use that and just make decisions based on that information perfectly, but they're best positioned to make that decision. Okay. Like so many conversations in Washington, uh, one might think that there aren't any other countries in the world that face these issues. Um, but the 27 members of the EU are grappling with this. They're doing it somewhat differently, and I think we might learn from watching their process. I hope we will watch it. I'm not sure exactly where they differ, but I do know that in case after case after case, EU diplomats and people funded by the European Commission are pulling back from peacemaking for, for precisely the same reason. They pulled back in Sri Lanka, they pulled back in Uganda and DRC and so forth. So I think there's going to be some experiential learning going on here. With that, we'll draw it to a close, but I want to thank you for coming and thank our presenters. <laughs>